everyone, welcome back to The Lookout. I'm uh, here tonight with Don Borzier. He's a veteran Southern California fire behavior analyst, long-term fire analyst, and geospatial analyst. Uh, he started his career in Big Bear in uh, 1985. And uh, Don and I worked together on uh, major CAL FIRE incidents over the years where I was uh, helping do GIS mapping and he was a fire behavior analyst. And so he watched the live stream last night and then he called me today and said, hey, I, uh, I got some information I'd like to share with you. And so uh, glad to have him on here and uh, welcome, Don. Glad to have you on the lookout. Thanks, Zeke. I, uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, so, so you're, you've are you been living on a sailboat or something? Yeah, I do. Uh, I got hired by Arizona to help uh, the state of Arizona mitigate the Yarnell Hill fire tragedy where we lost 19 firefighters. And I worked there for three years as assistant chief of the agency and state safety officer and helped mitigate that. And, uh, you know, it's just something that I hate to say it, it, it became my forte is helping people write staff rides on firefighter tragedies and, and uh, learning from unexpected outcomes. And in, in doing that, it puts a lot of burden on your shoulders. And so when I retired from fire altogether, uh, the best way to kind of get my mind right from seeing too many brothers that uh, passed was to jump on a sailboat and sail around the world. And uh, it certainly helped. And uh, now I'm in Florida because I like uh, I like fresh drinking water and not having droughts. So here I am with not, lots of green vegetation and lots of humidity and living the dream. Right. Well, well you can't you can't escape Southern California's uh, the magic of Southern California and the the mystery and the complexity. So I'm glad that you're willing to come out of retirement to uh, to do a gig here on the lookout. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, funny talking... because Go ahead. it's funny because us firemen we always you know keep our hands in it and you know you had your guest the other day, Tim Chavez who was actually my mentor uh, when I was coming up and we all keep our fingers in it and case in point and I'm going to show you some things uh, talking about the line fire. Um, I'm a partner in a consulting firm. And ironically, we just did the plans for the area that the line fire is burning in right now. And so I'm going to show you some of the uh, dynamics associated with this fire and the different places that it can go. And also some of the fuel mitigation and fuel treatments that uh, we found to be working thus far. So um, not completely out of the game, just uh, consulting on my terms still. Yeah, great. So um, do you want to pull up some of the stuff you've been working on and talk to us about it? Yeah, absolutely. So just to get people familiar with what a fire plan is, is that a fire plan is basically a firefighter's playbook um, on this. And I'll share my screen. And what it is, is when a fire starts to burn, we want to create a, a short document, about five, six pages that a firefighter or a fire manager can look at and help them win the game, so to speak, for lack of a better term. And in this particular one, this is just a draft um, of our typical bread and butter plan. And we do these plans all over the state. And actually we've done them uh, for Colorado also on, on the backside of the Colorado range uh, where we watch that area burn every year and so on. So in this particular one, the, the different pages uh, that we have here uh, relate to resources and fuels and uh, are there safety zones, uh, what kind of fire behavior we can expect, what are the, the topography, what are the weather conditions that contribute to large fire growth, um, we also talk about areas to park fire engines and safety zones. Uh, we talk about evac centers um, on these plants. But where I wanted to touch base um, with you guys and your group is what we would anticipate these fires to do. So not necessarily that the playbook, um, you know, is good for somebody concerned about natural resources, 
but hopefully it will make those who are concerned with natural resources understand why us firefighters do the things we do. And, and obviously we always want to prioritize life, property, and the environment in that order, unless it involves hazardous materials and then it's life, uh, the environment, and then property. Now this particular thing, and I'm, I'm gonna switch it around and do it upright, but this is uh, the one part of the document that I will model a fire that could possibly occur in our analysis area. And so let me get to the next one, which would actually be more uh, understandable and upright for that matter um, on this, is that this particular fire or modeling here is in an area called uh, the San Manuel um, area. It's kind of near an Indian uh, reservation. There's also a, an Indian Native American casino there. Um, but the irony behind this is this is right near where the fire started. As a matter of fact, the fire where it's burning right now, you'll see this at the top right of uh, this graphic I'm showing you. You'll see Fridalba and Panorama area. That is basically the start of Running Springs. And that's where it's hung up today, uh, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, right now. But this fire running unchecked, you can see its growth in one hour increments for six hours straight with no suppression efforts. But this does incorporate the effects of spotting. Okay, so this was a typical summer day. Um, looking at this, what I want to share with your group is that you're seeing one hour increments without suppression efforts on this, but it does show the effects of spotting. But here's what happens here up against this front country of San Bernardino Mountains is that every day, except this time of year, you get a marine layer that comes in and just bumps up against these uh, hills. Well, right about here on this graphic, right where you start to see Fridalba and Panorama, is right about where that marine layer sits on a typical day. And with that, um, that fuel starts to get a little more decadent, a little more moisture to it. Uh, it actually has recovered a little bit uh, more uh, since the last time there was a uh, an event that had come through that area, uh, probably in and around the old fire, 2007. And uh, Zeke, you do have the fire history maps available for that. But I wanted to show that. And now what I wanna show is I wanna share with the group where the fire is right now. So I've got two graphics for that. And where the fire is right now is an area um, up by Fridalba Road and Stanley Park. And this area right in here in the center is Stanley Park. Now you can see same weather conditions, upper elevation, that the growth is a bit slower. Now what has happened up here in this area is that the power companies have gone through after the beetle kill of the 80s and then also after uh, the old fire and the power company and different resource companies have gone through and done a bunch of thinning and cutting and uh, getting rid of, rid of the dead and down um, I don't know if I would call it some dedicated shaded uh, fire fuel breaks um, in that particular area, but it certainly is very, very similar. Um, and so you can see the effects of both those mitigations and also uh, the marine layer that bumps in there. Uh, here's another one further down uh, Arrow Bear area. Um, and you can see that this one, a little more volatile um, on this slope here, but not much, not much. You can, you can see that we're still getting a fair amount of spread and then it kind of goes up to the ridge and then it starts bumping up against uh, various barriers, whether they be roads or clearings and so on. So that's what we're looking at today um, on this uh, as to where that fire is um, and 
can talk about the range. Okay. So what have you got to talk about as far as like the, the longer term, like the threat on Tuesday of the fire, uh, potentially getting up to bear, big bear Lake or, um, Lake Arrowhead. Well, a couple, couple things that, you know, and your graphics did really well at showing the different roads and, and cutoffs. So depending upon what happens today, later today, if, if we have any, uh, cumulus buildup over the fire and as of 621 year time, Running Springs itself got real nominal precip today and a little lower on the mountain did get some and then definitely down towards Riverside County, they got some more. Uh, but when you start looking at this whole San Bernardino front range, you're going to see Highway 330 running up uh, through the middle and that's the current highway that they closed due to fire operations. Now, when you start to move to the west uh, up towards Cajon Pass, you're going to see Highway 18. Now, you know, it's ironic that the different things, fire occurrence and weather occurrences uh, that we have there, it's so easy to earmark them with uh, highways that we have running around or drainages for that matter. And, and so right about Highway 18, as you're looking at it here on the map, that's right about where our onshore flow will take a split. And about 25% of our onshore flow will go up towards the Cajon Pass. And that's where the old and Grand Prix fires, uh, that corridor went through there in 2007. To the right of Highway 18, towards that front country to the east, that's where about 50 to 75% of that onshore wind flow goes the other direction. Because wind is inherently lazy so it doesn't want to take the path of most resistance and go up and over these 10,000 foot mountains. It wants to go the easiest way and the easiest way are through these passes. As it goes through the passes to the east, then you start to move in towards two significant drainages. And one of them is Bear Creek and the other one is the San Bernardino, I'm sorry, Santa Ana River drainage. This Bear so, Creek here running up the 330? Uh, just to the right of it, actually, and, and then it pops out uh, further or closer up towards the dam, Big Bear Dam, uh, would be Bear Creek to the right. So when we get over there on that drainage, um, it's going to want to run up those, you know, all things coming into alignment and go up that drainage. Now, conversely, we know we get downslope down canyon winds at night. And that pattern should come back. So to answer your question, here's what we're going to be looking at is we're going to get a return possibly as early as tomorrow afternoon of onshore flow. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to scrub out that uh, smoke, which we know that puts a damper on fire ops. And then once that scrubs out, then uh, things will start to move again. Um, but very steep country right up in there. And it should start to make a push um, towards towards Big Bear itself. Um, obviously, so gaining think, speed is there, on it. Is, is there any opportunity for them to stop the fire anywhere out in here? So, it's in regards to you know areas of opportunity or whatever you want to call them. If you want to call them that, if you want to call them management action points, um, I, I would say. No, the, the only thing that would provide any management action points or, or areas of tactical advantage would be where we have a slope reversal. And so basically looking, I wouldn't call it drainages. I wouldn't make that an area of tactical advantage, but I would be looking for ridge tops um, and, and start focusing on those areas. Um, are they going to be fire stopping? Probably not because these uh, dozer lines or fire breaks or fuel breaks, you know, from the 60s, 70s, uh, those are long gone uh, and haven't been maintained um, to any large extent. Uh, so we'll just be looking at ridge tops and hoping that we can paint them first with aerial equipment and then get uh, boots on the ground to follow up in behind that um, on those ridge tops. So are there any so, ridge tops between the fire and fair creek that? Could be used. I I would say no. I I wouldn't. All right. It's I, they haven't had enough time to prep that whole area. 
um got it in so there. so yeah. if the weather conditions exist to move the fire past bear creek it's going to be they're going to be fighting it up here at the top of the ridge right it's going to be going through that and you know and i can show you another another graphic that gives you an example of what happens if you want to focus in onto uh big bear itself and you know tim tim did a great okay, job before talking we, about before we get there, there. uh-huh yeah, before we get there, how about the west side of the fire here out towards Lake Arrowhead? Uh, there's a major ridge here that so, comes down. Right. So if the fire managed to get pushed today, because we're not dealing with much wind today, so it's it's basically a fuels-driven fire unless we start to get some cumulus buildup over it. The winds seem uh, pretty variable uh, on today's uh, forecasts. And but if it was to get seated in that bowl there to the west because of some cumulus outflow winds, then definitely it's going to make a run up towards uh, Lake Arrowhead up the various um, chimneys that head up that towards Rim of the World Drive. So this ridge uh, here that we see, this ridge uh -huh. is right here behind City Creek Fire Station. That looks like that's been yeah, used that's, in the past. Has that been used successfully in the past? I, I would bet that's one of those original uh, fire breaks, fuel breaks um, from years gone by, or it could be associated with a previous fire. Yeah, and so they didn't hold the old fire there, though. The old fire's here in blue. Right. Held it at the right. ridge on that. And if it's any wonder what you know what the wind stream dynamics are that are going to push this fire around there, uh, right up on that ridge on rim of the world, that's a huge paragliding spot that they all jump off of and then paraglide down to San Bernardino every day. And so you can see exactly what that wind's going to do that fire once it gets established in those drainages. Okay, so do you want to? Talk a little bit about the kind of more specific uh, fire behavior potential around Big Bear Lake. Yeah, so let's let's keep our fingers crossed, and you know I've got high hopes that the crews are going to be effective. But you know, looking at your your graphics that you have there, and you can see uh, right there is Bear Creek um, heading up towards uh, Big Bear Dam, and to the left there you see uh, Snow Valley ski area, and that area. To the right of that, um, it's it's an area that the firemen and the locals call the Arctic Circle. And that's that road, Highway 18, going across from Snow Valley ski area across over to Big Bear Dam. And that is one very large mid-slope drainage, uh, or I'm sorry, mid-slope road uh, with a drainage below it. And then it goes up to Butler Peak, which is a historical fire lookout tower up there. Uh, on the ridge above that mid-slope road, Highway 18. But what happens there every day is those onshore winds come shooting up that and and start moving in towards that ridge line at Butler Peak. But then there's also a percentage that goes in over towards Big Bear and Big Bear Lake. And so when we look right there where you see the, the highway actually split at Big Bear Dam, um, and you see it go to each side of the lake. That's an area called fawn skim. And that draw right there leading up to the dam will actually channel that wind. And uh, I'll show you a quick graphic um, on this. And I can take it from there and show you the graphic. So this is a quick graphic of that lake, and then you can see uh, the road that goes on the North Shore. And this is again a six hour profile heading towards the community of fires of fawn skin. And you can see how that growth and how it, the wind in an everyday non-wind event onshore pattern will take that 
fire and carry that fire straight into that community. Uh, in this case, it's a period of about three hours unchecked um, before you start taking, actually houses will start to go immediately. There's a bunch of houses um, right there on the profile of that fire uh, model that I did. So, so, so it seems like with the predictions for the weather that we've got kind of a fairly narrow window where we're expecting strong westerly winds. Um, so if the fire kind of stays hung up for the next, you know, two days and then we get strong winds on it, I think that's kind of, that seems like kind of the wild card. It's like what are, we're going to have maybe, you know, a 12 hour window of high winds or 18 hours. And how far does the fire make it in that time period? Exactly. And it would be, it would be very easily um, to do. Here's, here's the thing also is looking at your graph, going back to your graphic that you had showing Big Bear Lake. If you look at Big Bear Lake, if this, if they do have these west winds on a typical summer day, what happens looking straight due east from Big Bear Lake is that I don't know that I would feel comfortable calling it a desert low, but you get the influences of the high desert and that actually creates a east wind running through that Big Bear Valley uh, area. And it's pretty well known among the aviation community is right out there at Big Bear Airport, there's a wind shear. And it's a convergence of the onshore wind and that desert low, for lack of a better term, uh, giving that right. east wind. And, 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 and it, Tim talked about that too, about how we just don't have many fires to go up and over. Right, right, and they hit that that desert low influence. And the same thing happens down south in, in San Diego County. When you get outside of Julian, you'll get that desert low influencing in, in the uh, front country there. The fire doesn't always go over. But if this is an enhanced onshore wind event, like you mentioned, um, it could override that desert low and and push further east. So I think the people who are watching this from Big Bear, you know, they want to know, like, what's the probability that we're going to have uh, that the fire is going to run this far in the next, you know, several days. And so yeah, I guess as a fire behavior uh, analyst, as an analyst, like, how do you approach a question like that? Well, so a fire behavior analyst, what you do is you time tag the fire's travel and you also associate that with time tagging um, the objectives that the firefighters have. And so it's our job to say, okay, how long is it gonna take us to create these barriers for fire spread before the fire gets there? And in this case with Big Bear, we really have to rely on a couple different things. Uh, the community itself on the South shore, those are all North aspect, uh, slopes on there. So the fire would probably run up uh, Santa Ana River drainage and then go up those south facing slopes and hit that ridge above Big Bear and substantially slow down. Um, that's one scenario that we would hope for on a, on a bread and butter fire without any type of uh, large weather event. Um, I think also, I would be we've also more... Got the We've also got the Radford fire here from 2022 that yes. will kind of be a catcher's mitt on fire coming up towards kind of the Moon Ridge area, right? Yep, it'll be on the, on the backside like, of Moon like Ridge that, area. That, so kind of just, um, just to the east of Snow Summit, we've kind of got this recent burn that kind of um, protects that. And we also got these fire lines that were put in during Radford that are probably being reopened. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so you would get that on that, that slope reversal would definitely be a, a huge area of tactical advantage for the big bear communities. I would still be a bit concerned about the North shore um, and the fire going the way that uh, that example I showed you on the North shore and through that corridor there, because there isn't much fire history. Um, through that area. And it's also all south aspects. 
slopes on there. So those are those are pretty yeah. hot slopes. Hot slopes meaning they take the bulk of the afternoon's heating and the fuels dry out more. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think that's a great overview. Um, do you have any other modeling from the Big Bear area that you want to talk about? Um, a few, but I think I would uh, get your viewers lost in the weeds until we start looking at fires going that way. Um, and great. let's keep my fingers crossed that I don't have to show those. Um, yeah. Well, great. Thanks, so, thanks for sharing your insights from your career working in this landscape. Anything else, you know, just following on... Um, on Tim's talk yesterday about some of these issues, you have anything to say about like Angeles Oaks and Mountain Home Village and different scenarios there? It sounds like, you know, this fire is gonna kind of come up and then back down towards them. Do you have any thoughts on how that might go? You know, there there will be some good areas in there. Um, there's a lot, a fair amount of camps through there, YMCA camps, Boy Scout camps, privately owned camps, uh, church camps through there and they've done a very, very good job as they have to uh, mitigating their fuels that surround their, that are on or surround their properties short of going on to forest service land. Um, and so in those communities, I can see areas of tactical advantage where the fire might uh, lay down a bit. Um, none of them are huge camps, but just the fact that there's a lot of camps and they all mitigate their fuels in order to get reinsured every year. Uh, Where from are their those insurance camps along, along through here? Uh, oh, they're just pocked, you know, all over Angeles Oaks and heading all the way up towards Onyx Summit, uh, Jenks Lake area, um, all in there. Uh, there's okay. all sorts of, of camps. Um, it's It's a tough corridor because as you go down below uh, Angeles Oaks area, you get into an area called Forest Falls. Um, it always seems like that area gets some sort of fire activity every year, but it's a box canyon. Um, yeah. And that's really not a great area to be a, um, to live in. And, and yeah, so we've got this, in, this blue but, here. So the, this is the 2020 El Dorado fire in blue. We talked about how that's likely going to slow this fire way down. Yes, absolutely. And that, that was a hot fire also. All right. Anything else you want to say about the San Bernardino front country while we're talking about this stuff? Um, I'm just available to call and talk anytime and ask any questions and text me if you have any questions or call me up and I'll be able to go All back right. on. Cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for reaching out, Berzier. Oh, and you got it, pal. Uh, enjoy I, that. I'm going to have my luck dodging I, those hurricanes. I'm going to have my iPad uh, on me when I go to Barbados, and so I'll be able to help you out as much as I can on my iPad. All right. Well, I'm going up in the ICR to do some field work here, and uh, if things get hairy, I'll I'll pop out the cell range and maybe we can uh, chat. What part are you going to? Here, let me let's finish this up. Okay. Signing off. Thank you all.